is here in this room, in your heart. He is near, nearer than breath, heartbeat, nearer than you are to you, more than second chance or next opportunity, closer than tonight or yesterday. He is real, realer than touch, see, hear, smell, or taste, realer than reality. He is our reality, realer than joy, pain, sorrow. He is present, is in, in, like space, wind, time, silence, night. He is waiting, like creation, like words on the tip of the tongue, like songs that have yet to be sung. He is beauty, oranges, blues, every hue, every shade. The sunrise and sunset whisper his name. He is different, made human, became human, forgave human. He is spirit, cannot be touched or explained, like sweet seconds of prayers, like grandmother on these wood floor bare. He is son, distinctly three, distinctly one, the only one, the only wise, the only resurrector of lives. He is king, and no earthly throne can house him. No amount of elegant words can espouse him. He is moments and voice, power of choice in word and deed and fruit and seed. Pierced side, nailed hands, nailed feet, innocent wounds that bled. He is belief and trust. He is enough. He is all. He is call and purpose. Everything that we can sacrifice, he's worth it and more, much, much more. Our good deeds are mere pennies. We'll never even the score. He is the whole and wow. He is who, what, when, why, and how. He puts on the show. He is the one we came to see. He is soul's cry and sinner's he is the epitome. He's the one no one can light a candle to or come within a million foot pole of. He is above. He is a father's love. He is maker of ways of truth and wit, earth and wind, ancient of days. Has no fear. Have no fear. God is here. Let's worship. Praise God. Praise God. And I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah. Fire. 
just lift your voices to the Lord. Hallelujah. You are worthy. King of kings, Lord of lords, deliverer, healer. We lift your name up high, God. I'll raise a hallelujah. Dismiss the children third grade and down. If you could go with Miss Holly in the back. And then if you would please join me in prayer for the offering. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we get to worship you freely with the members of the body. Thank you, God, how you provide for us and how you provide for your work to be done on the earth, God. And we just ask that you would bless this time of giving of our tithes and offerings and that it would be an act of worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Trust that you have come to worship this morning, and I'm glad that you got up in time to get here. Now, the earlier service, of course, that carried more import than saying it to you, but it just seems to me that something's wrong when you have to get up in the middle of the night. And uh, if God really wanted me to enjoy sunrise, he would have scheduled it later in the day. But, But it's great to be here with you all, to be worshiping together, lifting our voices in surrender and praise and uh, adoration. Thank you, praise team, for taking us there. And we're going to look into the Word of God again this morning. But before we do that, uh, as you know, some of you know, last weekend we had a very special visitor here in this service, Vice President Pence and his wife. And that was just a wonderful opportunity to have them here worshiping with us, to be able to pray over them. And uh, sun, actually, last Sunday night, I got an email from Vice President Pence, and I wanted to share that with you this morning. We can put it up there on the screen. As Karen and I returned to Washington, D.C., we just wanted to send along a note to you and the members of Sanibel Community Church to say thanks for the warm welcome at this morning's 9 a.m. service. Karen and I were deeply moved by the expressions of support, kindness, and prayers. We love Sanibel Island, and it is always an extra blessing to have the chance to worship at Sanibel Community Church, and that was especially true today. Thank you again, and may God bless you all, Mike and Karen Pence. So, thank you. so thank you for extending that hospitality. I know they sense the warmth of this congregation, which I do every Sunday, and it's just apparent. So thanks for being a blessing to them. I always like to refer back to what you've been reading in this previous week, and you've been in the First Corinthians, you're still there, still studying, still reading through, thank you for that. But I want to call your attention to one word, kind of a little jewel, a little oyster shell with a pearl in it we want to look at this morning, and that's in the First Corinthians 8, verse 1, where Paul writes, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. So he's making a contrast. And the context in which Paul is writing is that they've been talking about a issue that they've had in the church which had to do with the custom of that day and the culture in which they lived, where people would take food and offer it to idols. Now, the idols didn't eat much. And so they would take the food that had been on that pagan altar and take it down to the marketplace and would offer it at a reduced price. So it seemed, you know, it seemed prudent and economical and a wise stewardship for believers then to buy that meat at a reduced price. But some were saying, no, you, you know, you really should not be doing that because it's been tainted. It's been on a, a pagan idol. It's been offered to false gods. So Paul is addressing that, and it's always interesting when Paul talks about freedom, it's always in the context of giving up our rights for others. When he talks about the freedom we have in Christ, it's never in a context of, so go and show it off, you know, live life to the full, do what you feel free to do, God bless you. No, it's always, if you have freedom in Christ, here's what freedom means. You have the freedom to surrender your rights for the sake of others. And so we come to this verse then where he says, knowledge puffs up, puffs is an interesting word. And I've put some synonyms up there on the screen for you. Uh, Paul's challenge is, are you putting me first or are you putting you first? What is your attitude as a believer? Me first, I'll do what I want to do, what I have the freedom to do, or is your attitude you first? I will surrender my rights. I will defer to you. That's Paul's thrust. So the word phusa in the Greek literally means bellows. Think of uh, the bellows used in a blacksmith shop. You know, you're pushing that air through. Or an accordion, the bellows of an accordion. Or the old pump organ, you know, where you're pushing air through. So that's this idea of being puffed up. It's being proud, swollen, inflated, prideful, arrogant. Paul says, that's not what you ought to be as believers. You can have all knowledge of what you're able to do, but don't let that puff you up. 
big in your own estimation and walking over the top of others. So he contrasts that, not in this passage, but think of the way he contrasts that with the word agape, which is love, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter, where he says in verses 4 and 5, love does not think too highly of itself. So, you know, you choose. Are you going to be puffed up or are you going to give up? You know, what's the choice? And as believers, we have freedom in Christ, but let's be careful that we don't use that as an inflated version of ourselves. Like, we got all knowledge, we can do this. No, we surrender, we defer to one another. We do not think too highly of ourselves. We let love rule in the body. That was just a great uh, word that Paul speaks to us. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that it is eternal in nature. It will never pass away. And we have the privilege of being exposed to the eternal Word of God on a daily basis. What grace, what mercy, particularly to America where it is so freely given out. We hear it, we read it, we see it constantly. And I pray that we would never be puffed up in our knowledge, but rather we would treat one another with true agape, putting others first. And this morning, as we look into the Old Testament, we realize that Paul told us it was written for our admonition today. And so we want to learn. We don't want to just see it as a, as a history book, but we want to see what are some principles, what are some lessons that we can learn through the experience of the Israelites, the Jewish people, long ago. So guide us in our thinking and our discovery and also in our application of truth this morning. For the glory of Jesus, I pray. Amen. We want to talk about discouragement today. How many have ever been discouraged? How many are good liars? All right, so we, uh, you know, we tend to have discouragement through life. Life is not always rosy. We're not always happy and excited and all of that. There are times when we're really down, singing the blues, like things are not going well. And this is not what I anticipated when I committed my life to Jesus. I thought... He's going to be, make me happy all the time. And we learn through experience that that is not God's highest goal to make me happy. It is his highest goal to make me holy. And in making me holy and more like Jesus, he has to run rough. He has to take some rough edges off of my life. And he does that through some difficult times. So in those times, how do I avoid getting discouraged? And I found that the major cause of discouragement in my life is a loss of perspective. Just a loss of perspective. I get so taken up with what's happening in the here and now that I lose sight of an eternal perspective. Now, supposing we were to stretch a wire from here all the way over to, uh, well, to the chapel at least, maybe, what is it, Jerry's over there? You know, stretch a wire all that distance. And that represents eternity. Of course, it's not, but it represents eternity. How much of that wire would represent your lifetime? Or how much of that wire would represent today and the struggles that you're going through today? Well, you'd have to have a a microscope to get anywhere near seeing it. You see, it's perspective. But we get so taken up with the temporal that we lose sight of the eternal. We lose our perspective. It's all about me. It's what's happening to me. And in that process, I lose sight of what God is saying and how God is acting in my life and what he's doing around me. And it's when I turn from the eternal to the temporary, when I turn from the spiritual to the selfish, that's when I get discouraged. I lose sight of what God is doing. The truth is, discouragement many times comes right before God's richest blessings. Many times when we are going through the hardest times, it's God preparing us for the rich outpouring of his grace and new discoveries about himself. Charles Spurgeon was pastoring in London as one of the greatest pastors of that century. And he said this, The cloud is black before it breaks. It overshadows before it yields rain of mercy. He said, It has become to me a prophet in rough clothing a John the Baptist heralding the near coming of God's richer blessings. So the darkest hour is many times just before the dawn. With that in mind, let's go to our text. In Exodus chapter 6, I want to read the first nine verses. It'll be on the screen from the NIV. And just a word of explanation. 
Sometimes I'll tell you it's from this translation or the other, and it varies from week to week. When I say, for instance, it's from the NIV, it's from my edition of the NIV. And I have to clarify that because, you know, there are always uh, sequences, you know, revisions of different texts. And so somebody comes up and says, that's not what my NIV said. Well, that's, you know, that's very possible because translations keep getting updated. So bear that in mind, please. So here it is, and it's on the screen. The Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Speaking of the Israelites. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. That's that great I am title of God. I appeared to Abraham to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. So now God is doing a little name dropping, referring back to the patriarchs, the loved people that went before them, the Jewish fathers. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they lived as aliens. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. They were so discouraged when this incredible message of deliverance comes straight from the mouth of God, they couldn't hear it. You ever been there? God wants to speak to you, but you're so down, you're so discouraged, you can't hear it. You don't hear God's voice. Why were they so down? Well, let me suggest a number of reasons. First of all, their situation seemed hopeless. Will we ever be delivered? This bondage is just incredible. It is so hard. It's weighing upon us. We are so oppressed. And it's so bad, God says he's going to have to unpry the hands of Pharaoh. God's going to have to force Pharaoh, an ungodly man, king, ruler, he's going to have to force his hands in order to deliver the Israelites. Hopeless situation. Secondly, and this is an important thing, They had not personally experienced the deliverance of God. Their forefathers had, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They had experienced God doing things for them, speaking to them, etc. But these Israelites, they had not experienced God in that fashion. It's a lesson I had to learn, and maybe some of you have had to learn. Because I know that God is faithful. I've seen it in my parents' lives, how God provided constantly for them. I've seen it in great missionary endeavors, miracles happening around the world, God speaking in. But there comes a point where even though I've seen it and heard about it, it has to become mine. Okay. I have to see it personally. I have to make the faith of our fathers my faith. And these people had not gotten to that point. They were resting on the God who was, the God who operated in the past. (coughs) And so that's why they were discouraged. It was not a personal experience for them. Thirdly, their problem had lasted many years. They were worn. They were into a problem which they saw no escape from. Many years. It's like if you are struggling with a, a bad habit or a sinful habit, and you say, I've been enslaved to this for years and years and years. There's just, there's no hope. And because we get discouraged, we say, it can't happen. You know, we just get discouraged. God c- could not possibly bring deliverance to me. It's just been too long. And then 
They were physically and emotionally exhausted. They were worn out. They were despondent. They had suffered a lot. And so they were discouraged. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been so discouraged that you, you just couldn't hear God? Uh, maybe so discouraged you didn't even want to hear God. You're just so locked into your circumstances, got your eyes so much on your problems and yourself that you stay away from church, you don't read your Bible, you're really not interested in hearing from God. Your heart is not ready to hear from God. You're too wrapped up in your temporal vision. So you become numb to any kind of worship experience. Maybe you come and you, you see what's happening in the church, you appreciate it, but it doesn't strike you. You, know, you. you don't really sense the presence of God here. God doesn't seem to be directly into your life because of discouragement. There are two great lessons I want us to see this morning from this passage. They didn't learn these lessons, but it's important for us to learn them. First of all, God hears us when we're hurting. God always has his ear tuned to us. We may not think he hears. We may not feel like he hears. We may not sense that he hears, but he does. Every time they had complained about their condition in Egypt, Pharaoh had increased the load. And so I'm sure they began to associate their prayers for deliverance with more burdens. It's just the way it was going for them. Their complaints arose. They were in bondage. They didn't realize that God was listening to all of their complaining. God heard their cries. God hears. I think there are four reasons why we sometimes feel God does not hear, that he's not alert to us. For one thing, we may have a pain problem. Pain can blind us to what God wants to do in our lives. We're so hurting that we just don't hear his voice. A pain problem. Maybe you've gone through the loss of a relationship. Maybe there are family issues. Uh, maybe there's an addiction problem. There's a spiritual problem, medical problem. These things create pain in our lives. And it dulls our spiritual senses. We're overcome by the pain. Even the pain of a beloved pastor leaving after 17 years. That's painful. And in the process of working through that grief and that separation and that loss and that sense of why did God do this to us, we can become callous to what God wants to do for us now. Okay. So we, get, we need to refocus on the Lord. Secondly, we may have a timing problem. God's timing is always perfect. Our timing is never perfect. Okay. So we have to make an adjustment and say, it's on God's timetable, not on my table timetable. And there are times when I'm not prepared to hear God's voice. I have a mindset that God doesn't really care about me. A little girl wrote a letter to God. She said, dear God, are you for real? Some people don't believe it, and if you are, you better do something real quick. Okay? So, in other words, God, get in on our calendar, please, or, or maybe you're not real. Some doubts. God has to bring us through circumstances to bring us to a point where we are ready for him to do something. And he often uses those very things that get us discouraged and despondent. He uses those things to create an awareness of him, a desire for him to work in our lives. So it's a timing issue. Let me say something else about timing. Uh, Romans 8, 28. Probably many of you have memorized the verse. It's a favorite of many. We know that all things, what? Work together for good to them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I've, I've quoted that verse a lot. I've had that verse quoted to me a lot when I've been discouraged. And usually when it's quoted to me, it doesn't, doesn't really register. I know it too well. Yeah, I know that scripture. I believe it, but I don't sense it. I don't feel like it. So when I think of Romans 8.28, I like to put it in my mind in the context of God is a master baker. Okay, now follow me on this. He's a master baker. So God is creating something in my life. Okay, he has an end in mind. He knows what he's about. And in the process of creating that in my life, he knows 
I need to put this ingredient in, I need to put this ingredient, this ingredient, this ingredient, and this ingredient. So God is adding these ingredients into my life. Not only is he putting these ingredients in my life, but he knows how much of each ingredient. You wouldn't put a cup of salt when you're baking a cake and a teaspoon of flour. You know, you you know how much of what to put into that recipe to get the desired result. Now, if I were to walk into your kitchen and you just start making a cake and I were to say to you, that bowl full of flour looks disgusting. It does not look appetizing at all to me. I don't think you know what you're doing. Well, I'm judging you too early, right? And many times we are guilty of judging God too early, what he's putting into our lives. We say, this doesn't look right, God. This doesn't, I don't know how you could use this in my life. And God's saying, would you wait? I've got a process I'm working on here. Then, after he puts the ingredients into my life, he does this thing which really makes me uncomfortable. He puts me into the oven. Okay? <laughs> he's he's going to bake this stuff, Okay? But again, God knows what the temperature needs to be for me or for you. He knows what temperature, and he's got the timer set. He knows when to take me out of the oven, all right? So God is working all these things together in my life because he's doing a process, which is described in the next verse there in Romans 8, that he works this out because he's making in me the likeness of Christ. That's his goal in my life. So God is this master baker. This is all the timing of God. And if we don't allow ourselves to be open to God's timing, we're not dealing with discouragements very well. All right? So recognize God is working on his clock. Thirdly, we may have an attitude problem. Maybe, you know, you ever get into that stinking thinking stuff, you know, where everything looks black, Nothing can ever go right for me. You know, we're just down on ourselves and down on everybody else. Life just continually gets worse. It gets difficult to keep our attitudes and our spirits up. And the longer the problem goes on, it seems like the more discouraged we can get. But the truth is, God chooses exactly the path for me. And fourthly, we just may have a faith problem. Maybe I'm not trusting God enough through circumstances. I think, maybe I could do a better, have a better solution for this, God. Yours is taking too long, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create another plan, God. I can help you out. All right? So a faith problem. Our faith begins to grow dim. We question, does God really hear me? Note this. Unbelief puts our circumstances between us and God. It's this huge mountain. Faith, or trust, on the other hand, puts God between me and my circumstances. Different perspective. Where is God in my life? Is he out there beyond this mountain of discouragement, or is he between me and the mountain? Where is God? A faith problem. There's an account in Acts 12, which you're familiar with. It's a story about persecution in the early church. Herod was getting a little out of control. He was starting to take out the church leaders, uh, executing them, imprisoning them. And in verse 5, we read, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So Peter has been a victim of Herod's wrath and persecution, been arrested. He's in jail. The church, in the meantime, is having a prayer meeting. They are fervently praying for Brother Peter. Verse 13. Well, between there, God delivers Peter, gets him out of jail. All right, verse 13, Peter knocked at the outer entrance. Now, this is the prayer meeting. Okay. He knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening the door. <laughs> Leave it to Rhoda. She said, Peter is at the door. Oh, why didn't you let him in? What did they respond? You're out of your mind. <laughs> You're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, so they said, well, maybe it's an angel. Maybe he died in prison, his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. It says, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. <laughs> they were just praying that Peter would be released, and his, when he's released, they can't believe it. They're, they're astonished. It's like... Uh, Rhoda, don't interrupt us, we're praying. 
And, and she's saying, but your prayers have been answered. Shh, shh, don't interrupt our meeting, you know. So discouraged with a lack of faith, they couldn't believe God had answered their prayers. What is your faith quotient? Press on, keep praying, and expect God to answer. Expect results. So the first lesson in the passage is that God hears us when we are hurting. Second big lesson, our problems make it possible for us to know God in a greater way. Our problems make it possible for us to know God in a greater way. Back in Exodus, verse 3 of that chapter 6, God said that the patriarchs knew him as God Almighty. That's El Shaddai. That literally means the God who is on the mountain, the Almighty, the God who can do anything. He is all-powerful. But he was not known to those patriarchs as Yahweh or Jehovah God. So God is about to reveal himself to these Hebrew slaves in a way that he never revealed himself to their idolized patriarchs. Okay, Something fresh is going to come to their intimacy with the Lord through their problems. God is God, but at different times in our journey, he reveals himself to us in different ways. He prepares us to learn more about him. And many of those revelations come through difficult times. When we are at our wit's end, we see no light, no hope, no promise. And God somehow breaks through and we see him, experience him in a fresh, vital, new way, refreshing way. Different attitudes or attributes are shown to us in meaningful ways at different times. But we're not always ready to receive. And that, again, is part of the process. He makes us ready to receive through the trials that we're going through. Through the hurts, we grow closer. I've read that shepherds have a really strange way of dealing with straying sheep. Straying sheep. They break their legs so that the shepherd has to carry the sheep at all times. And in those days of healing, the sheep comes to know the shepherd in an intimate, close, and dependent way. Never would have known the shepherd that close if he had not had his legs broken through discipline. Okay? But because of the problem, he is now ready to receive something, and he is brought close to the heart of the shepherd during that time of healing from wounds. That's a lesson for us. God is trying to bring us closer to his heart. He wants more of an intimate relationship with us. And he will use these difficulties of life and the brokenness that we suffer to accomplish that purpose. I remember years, in our, years ago in our service for Christ where Kathy and I learned that Christ, God himself, is our provider. Now sometimes he uses a paycheck to provide. But there are other times where he did not use a paycheck. We didn't have a paycheck. We were living on faith. And it was just marvelous to see how God met our needs without us ever advertising them. God supplied our needs at just the right time, at the appropriate moments, and in the right amounts. God was our provider. So we don't have trouble trusting God today. We don't have trouble with him being the Lord of our possessions. That that issue was settled years ago when we learned that God was faithful. God would supply. God would take care of us. But if we had not been in those situations, we might still struggle today. So God uses that. David says in Psalm 119, 71, It is good for me that I was afflicted. <laughs> David, something happened to your mind. <laughs> okay. He said, It's good for me I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. In other words, David's saying, it was good I went through these trials because I learned something about God that I would not otherwise have learned. God uses our troubles. Every time we come up against a difficult circumstance, God wants to reveal himself in a new and beautiful way. So here's my admonition. When you're going through discouragement, tough times, run to him. Run to the, his arms. Run to his heart. Don't back away. Don't stay away from church. Don't put the Bible on the shelf. This is a time to nestle into his arms. Grow in your intimacy and in your faith and trust. We offer him our problems. He offers us himself. And that's enough. He is all sufficient. 
In Exodus 6, verse 3, he's saying, To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I was known as a powerful God who could do anything, but to you, I'm going to be more than a God who is almighty. I'm going to be your friend, and I'm going to stick with you through every circumstance. He said to Moses, you, you tell these depressed children of Israel that I am the Lord. And when they say, we are slaves, you say, but he is the Lord. He is above the circumstances. Moses, you as a leader must take their focus off of their problems, put their focus on me, let them see me as their ever-present solution, the one who is sufficient for every problem and circumstance of life. Now, notice this also. Eight different times in the verses we read, God said, I will. I will. He's not only the great I am, he is the great I will. He is not only a God who is, he is a God who does. He acts on our behalf. For you, Moses, I am not only a mighty God, I'm a God who walks with you through your bondage, through your slavery, through your discouragement. I will be with you through the plagues. I'll be with you through the wrath of Pharaoh. I will be with you through the Red Sea. I will be with you across the wilderness. I will be with you as a pillar of fire and a cloud by night. You will know my presence. Wow. That's what God wants to do to you and to me. He wants us to know him intimately to know his presence. So here are some suggestions when you're going through some tough times. First of all, look and listen for what God is teaching you. Instead of saying, why does this happen to me? What are you doing to me, God? Instead, ask the question, Lord, this is really difficult. What are you trying to teach me? What am I to learn through this difficulty? And maybe the only thing I'm to learn is how to be more empathetic to others who are going to go through the same suffering. That's what Paul said. Okay. We go through sufferings in order to comfort those who go through like sufferings. So that may be one reason. Maybe it's a disciplinary thing. Maybe God's breaking our leg. You know, we're, we've been disobedient. Maybe that's it. But always ask that question, not what, but why. Okay. What do you want me to learn? Should have said it the other way. Not why, but what. What do you want me to learn from this experience? Look and listen. Secondly, Make the difficult time a time for growth. When we get discouraged, we're going through hard times, what we tend to do is put our spiritual life on idle. Okay? We just set it aside. We prefer to sit and soak in our sorrow. All right? This is a time for growth, even as a church. Okay? I understand some of you are reeling with the loss of the pastor. I understand that. It's a deep grief. You know, need to go through the grieving process. Okay? But look at this time as... God, are you going to grow us through this or are you going to destroy us through this? Okay. This is a time for growth. What do you have on the horizon for us, God? How are you going to reveal yourself to us that we haven't known yet? What new thing are you going to do in our midst? How can we follow you even more closely? And then focus on God not on your problems. Focus on God. I want to read just a couple passages from the Old Testament. I'll read these rather quickly. Uh, a couple of famous characters wrote these passages. One is uh, Asaph, who was a chief musician, and the other was King David himself. First of all, Asaph, and I'm going to read Psalm 42 from the New Living Translation, but listen to the heart of Asaph. As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. So he's, he's got a thirst here for God. He says, I thirst for God, the living God. Where can I go? When can I go and stand before him? Listen now. Day and night, I have only tears for food. My enemies continually taunt me, saying, where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowds of worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy, giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. Ever been there? God, you're just not fresh in my life. I, I remember those feelings. I remember being in the, with other worshipers. I remember the joy and the thanksgiving overflowing in my heart. And, and now look at me, God. Why am I discouraged, he writes. Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior 
and my God. And he reverts. I'm deeply discouraged, but I will remember you, even from distant Mount Hermon, the source of the Jordan, from the land of Mount Mazar. I hear the tumult of the raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. It's a storm in my life. But each day, the Lord pours out his unfailing love upon me, praying to God who gives me life. O God, my rock, I cry. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones. They scoff, where is this God of yours? But then that wonderful refrain, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Wonderful, wonderful attitude in times of discouragement. And then King David, Psalm 34 from the Living Bible. I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. I will constantly speak of his glories and grace. I will boast of all his kindness to me. Let all who are discouraged take heart. Let's praise the Lord together and exalt his name. Because I cried to him and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Others too were radiant at what he did for them. Theirs was no downcast look of rejection. This poor man cried to the Lord, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. For the angel of the Lord guards and rescues all who reverence him. Oh, put God to the test and see how kind he is. See for yourself the way his mercies shower down on all who trust him. If you belong to the Lord, reverence him. For everyone who does this has everything he needs. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those of us who reverence the Lord will never lack any good thing. Great chapters to read when you're feeling down, discouraged, disheartened. So here's an action step this morning. Got your pen and pencil handy? I want you to write down the discouraging thing in your life right now. Don't write a book, don't write a paragraph, just a word or two. Identify what it is that tends to discourage you right now in your life journey. I'm discouraged. My problem is this. Just a couple words. Go ahead. Write something down. This is what is discouraging to me. Name it. Cell phones. <laughs> now, write this down. I think I have it on the screen, if not in your bulletin. Write this down. God, you are enough. God, you are enough. You and you alone are sufficient for the need of my life. You and you alone are sufficient for the need of my life. Now sign your name. Okay. Sign your name. This is what's bothering me. God, you are sufficient. I'm ready to listen, ready to learn. I sign my name. I will rejoice in you again.